Thanks. Um, oh, sorry, I have got a, st a stinking cold. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Simon for asking me to speak and uh, just say what a pleasure it is to be here again. Um, today, I'd like to present the results of five years' worth of keyhole excavation on six Aberdeenshire hill forts undertaken between 2005 and 2010. All the work was undertaken with local volunteers, students, and in my and colleagues' holidays, and I know a few uh, familiar faces here in the audience. I should explain that I'm using the term hill fort as a generic term to cover any defended site, regardless of size or whether or not it's on a hill. I probably should choose enclosure, but it's just not as sexy, and um, oh yes, hill forts are very sexy. Uh, <laughs> Keyhole excavation does exactly what it says in the tin. It's pioneered by the late Professor Leslie Alcock, and effectively it's limited targeted excavations to answer specific questions, and in this case, what data the defence is. And here we're looking at uh, excavations we did at Dunadier, and literally it was that trench on that size of hill fort, and in this case just to um, recover dating evidence from the inside face of the rampart here. Now, the origin of uh, this project were well, the series of uh, rescue excavations that I managed on behalf of AOC Archaeology at Kintoa, Aberdeenshire, between 2000 and 2006. These excavations uncovered a variety of features ranging in date from the Neolithic to the medieval, and of particular note for this paper was the unenclosed settlement sequence which comprised around 35 roundhouses ranging in date from 1800 BC to 200 BC. This just gives you an impression of the, uh, of the sequence of radiocarbon dates. And there is a break around the year, the closing centuries BC, early centuries AD, when the settlement sequence kicks off again around 600 AD. And this may or may not be to do with a Roman marching camp. It's sort of around here. Now, there is actually clear evidence in the wider area for later Iron Age structures, i.e. around 200 BC to 400 AD, so it's not as if this is a, it's a settlement shift rather than a settlement break, but I will come back to that later on. Now, the same couldn't be said for earlier Pictish structures, i.e. AD 400 to 600, which were unknown in this area before this project. Now, I was very keen to move beyond the typical confines of a, typical confines of a commercial dig, where restrictions are placed on, a, on the scope of the research on the basis of the footprint of the development, i.e. a house is so, so large you don't dig beyond the footprint of the house. In particular, I wanted to see how the various hill forts in the area related to the unenclosed settlement sequence, and it's worth stressing just how rare uh, hill forts are in Aberdeenshire compared to, say, East Lothian, obviously down here in the south. But I think that this makes for a very nice, tightly defined study. Now, at the same time as I was pondering how to do this, the Royal Commission uh, produced the excellent volume uh, Shadow of Benahim, which was a comprehensive survey of the monuments in and around Kintour and the wider Strathbone. But here we are here with the, the study area of the commission's area. Now this excellent volume characterises hill forts in the area to six different types based on the size and nature of the defences, though there was no significance to the order. And in fact, this was the third such attempt to classify the same hill forts using the same evidence since the 1960s. And in each case, different conclusions were reached. It struck me that the best way forward was to gather new evidence, and specifically the dates of the construction of the various sites' defences. However, excavating hill forts is an expensive and time-consuming procedure. The only way I could achieve this, on very limited budgets, was to restrict the field work and thus also the resultant post-excavation and reporting costs, hence keyhole excavation. I should also say that I own an awful lot of people, an awful lot of plants, which is why I no longer drink in Edinburgh. Um, <laughs> now, once we have these dates, I believe that we can start asking more interesting questions. But until we get the dates, we don't even know what the questions are. Thus, I decided to examine one of each of the six different types of hill fort in the Royal Commission study, uh, the Royal Commission scheme. Now, the sites were selected on the basis of ease of access and the willingness of landowners to allow work on their land. In each case, the volume of excavation was dependent upon the nature of the site and the questions to be asked. Thus, the scale of excavation varied from 30 metre long trenches with a dozen test bits 
to two metre log trenches on one site. Now, these are the sites that we selected, and I'm just going to run through these in order of size. And before the work that we undertook, um, there was no dating evidence for any of these. Um, Hellview, Leslie, the first one, and the largest, uh, 350 metres east to west by 175 metres north south, comprises a pair of parallel banks with a slight scoop in between them, and they survive best on this section. The gaps are probably to do with later uh, attrition caused by ploughing. This is camp. Covers circa 2.7 hectares, comprises a single vitrified rampart for much of its extent, with an additional external bank at its entrance. That's the external bank and that's the entrance. And in case anyone doesn't know what vitrification is, this is uh, a process by which timber lined ramparts are set on fire and reach such a high temperature that the stones melt and fuse together. And some of you might recognise this uh, slide from the Arthur C. Clarke Mysterious World Programme where the experiment was conducted by Professor Ian Ralston. So back to the sites. I also should say these are all at a scale and they're cut and pasted from the Royal Commission book, which is very good. Well worth buying. Um, Hello Barra, the next one, measures 122 metres by 95 and comprises three sets of banks with multiple entrances. You can see entrances here and here, here and here, with some of the these entrances blocked by an inner rampart, so clear evidence of phasing, and that's just probably cattle poaching. Um, Cairnmore, this is Cairnmore here, um, comprises, uh, it's about 40 to 50 metres in diameter. The original plan, this one here, shows a pair of stone banks, but the current interpretation of the Royal Commission is that this is just the spread of a single bank, spread over um, 5 to 10 metres. Maiden Castle, the finest and the, the, the last and the smallest, is about 20 metres in diameter and comprises a stone enclosure surrounded by a bank and ditch system with an entrance to the south east. Now all of the locations of these hill forts are just on the edge of the high ground. It's perhaps implying access or, or rather control of access to um, the more fertile pastures in the lowlands or, or uh, travel or access perhaps. But until we know the dates of these, we can't really figure out what, the, uh, what they mean. Now, I should say that having spent some time getting to know all of these sites, I'm not really sure that any of them are defensive. The obvious exception might be uh, Dunadir, which has um, massive walls and um, <coughs> massive solid walls without a gate. Now, but I don't think they're defensive in, say, the way of marching camps or medieval castles. I feel that the defences are more about show. They're incomplete in some cases, large at the entrance and tiny around the sides. There's lots of dead ground, and there are often more defendable locations in the immediate locale. Uh, dare I say it that these are the prehistoric equivalents of stone cladding. It's a bit more impressive and tasteful. Right. The results again in chronological order. A lot of information here. Um, Hell, of Hell of New Leslie. Now, the slight bank and shallow scoop contain no subsurface elements and may in fact represent a palisade of some description. Gorse burning on the site had spread modern charcoal throughout the section and I couldn't get a date from it, but I'm assuming a date of uh, circa 1000 to 800 BC on the basis of other large hilltop enclosures, for example, Yulvin Hill and Chopra Law, although in each of these cases the evidence is equivocal. Hello Barra. There is a ditch just um, to the outside of the inner rampart. We got charcoal from the base of the ditch dating to the 560 to 360 BC, which implies that the ditch was cut before that date. The outer banks are later, obviously, because the inner bank, the inner rampart blocks that entrance. Bruce's camp. We recovered um, uh, charcoal from burnt in situ posts indicated that the rampart was vitrified around or immediately after 410 to 340 Cal BC. We also found an additional rampart 
at the entrance, which reused some of the vitrified stone. Dunadir, again, this was just the inner enclosure that we were dating. We got uh, two different dating methods here. We recovered charcoal from the inside face of the rampart, which was the first slide you saw of the excavation. But we also uh, dated the vitrified stone itself through archaeomagnetic dating. And the combined evidence from the two methods indicates that the rampart was fired around 250 BC. Bruce's camp again, there was a first century AD Roman crucible from the interior. So it indicates reuse of the site, but not necessary. We couldn't link it to the uh, refortification. Hello, Barra again. There is another ditch between the inner, uh, between the middle and outer ramparts. And uh, we recovered charcoal from the basal fill of this ditch dating to between 380 and 580 AD. So it's a Pictish refortification of a site that in its first incarnation is earlier than 560 to 360 Kelvin C, so approximately a thousand years between them. Maiden Castle, again two types of defences here, the stone and the bank and ditch. We, we identified a new bank and ditch on, in this phase um, and charcoal recovered from beneath both the bank and the ditch and the stone, the inner stone enclosure indicate that uh, both were built after 420 to 650 Cal BC, uh, Cal AD rather. Cairnmore, quite a radical change here. This is actually um, uh, FECOM's 1966 plan and this is the current plan based on our <coughs> excavations last year. Um, Charcoal recovered from above this rampart, which appears to be fire, but not vitrified, and charcoal from below this rampart, this, this rampart here, indicate that the site was uh, built and destroyed between 410 and 640 AD. In addition, from a foundation cut at this middle rampart here, we recovered um, a pin mould, two brooch moulds, and a crucible, all of which are tentatively Pictish at the moment. No. <laughs> Tables, don't you love it? Um, I'm really still thinking about the dates and what, what this information all means. The last excavation was uh, last year. I only just got the radiocarbon dates through courtesy of Gordon Cook, who's in the audience as well. And a big thanks to Gordon there. Um, what we're looking at is just the period covered by um, both my excavations at Kintor and the Hillforts, divided into 200 year periods with do we have hill forts? This one here, so it's a yes or no, and the question mark obviously over the um, Hill of New Leslie occupations. What's the open settlement like? And in most cases, it's isolated, i.e., single roundhouses or structures set 400 to 200 BC. We start to get clusters, and also in the Pictish period, we again start to get clusters. This just indicates that there's a generic background activity of pits stray artifacts, etc. So as I say, I'm still thinking about what exactly this means. But it is clear that hill forts are an aberration. They're not something that's routinely built. Um, there's no grand evolution in Aberdeenshire. And while some of the evidence has lessons or implications for the wider Scottish picture, this is very much a Strathstone story. Um, and again, just to point out that there are perhaps 600 or 800 years worth of hill fort construction potentially over a two and a half thousand year sequence. Now, just to look in detail at the Middle Iron Age sequence and also subsequently the Pictish sequence, but I'll start with the Middle Iron Age. Now, obviously we dated Bruce's camp. These are unenclosed roundhouses excavated at, sequence, at, at Kintour. And one of the significant findings from the Kintour sequence was that roundhouse entrance orientation is possibly chronologically diagnostic, i.e. it moves anti-clockwise with time. So these are Middle Bronze Age, South, Southwest, Late Bronze Age, South, Early Iron Age, Southeast, Middle Iron Age, Northwest. So, just to point out that the Bruce's camp entrance is Northwest, 
Now, by extrapolation using the Royal Commission scheme, the only other health form um, in, this, in this class is the outer enclosure at Dunedia, which also has a northwest entrance. So, there is something very strange going on in the sort of period 500 to 200. As I say, roundhouses start to occur in clusters. The entrances move to the northwest, having previously been orientated south or southeast. And at the end of the period, there was that break in occupation that I pointed out with that radiocarbon run. So around 200 BC, everything moves. And again, of course, the inner fort at Dunedia, which is, is destroyed around 250 BC, presumably having been built a sort of a generation before. And in case anybody wonders what a roundhouse looks like, there we go. And that Hillary Murray built uh, based on, I think, uh, the plan of that one, actually. It's quite interesting. Um, so I don't really have any answers at the moment <laughs> about what these patterns mean. I just think they're very interesting. But what I'd like to do now is move on to the Pictish evidence. Now, Kermore was dug, and by extrapolation, um, what we have are two other sites in the area, Barflat, which is a crop mark enclosure, and Wiedelmont. And both Wiedelmont and Barflat look like Maiden Castle, which is actually here. So this is a sort of extrapolation of our evidence, and, and Rhiney, which I'll come on to. Rhine is actually where all the a variety of Pictish symbol stones were identified, including the Rhiney man, which was reported by the late Ian Shepherd. There's just some of the Pictish symbol stones, but I think there's 12 or 13 from Rhiney, in addition to those, um, those settlements. Now, if we then extrapolate to the, the sort of results of the Pictish, the excavations at Cairnmore and Maiden Castle to the rest of the Royal Commission sequence, scheme. You get this. And in addition, I've added some other Pictish dates. So Maiden Castle we dug, Cairnmore we dug, Wiedelmont, Barflat, White Hill, and Hill of Care by extrapolation. Hill of Barra has a Pictish date, and Mither Tap, which is the third highest hill fort in Scotland and very impressive, has a Pictish half in its interior. So there is a bit of a pattern running east-west um, here. Hill of Care on the outside. And just a couple of a few things to point out here. Obviously, these are the a range of the range of hills here, and there's Pictish occupation at the foothills. But there isn't the same occupation here. And there isn't the same occupation here. If we then take the class one Pictish symbol stones and put them on the same plan, so the red are the class one symbol stones. The pattern, a number of things emerge. Pictish symbol stones are more widespread than the enclosures. But also, we have a number of clear clusters. Around Rhiney, and that's the A97 moving north, and I think a less to a lesser degree around here, around Inverurie, and in, in effect the A96 running up that way. Again, I'm not very sure what all of this means. I think we're looking at control of access, and I have to say that the that I think these are more impressive, there's a more impressive cluster here than this cluster. Uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm not entirely sure what all this means because I am still thinking about, about it. But there is a key observation here, which I haven't imposed, that this concentration is more or less the core of the later album of uh, Giri, which is settled, uh, centered on in Baruri, around here. I'm not quite certain what that means, but it does imply a certain degree of um, continuity, perhaps. Now, I do know that uh, Gordon Noble, who's in the university, is doing some very interesting work around Barflat, and I hope that he's going to ask the questions and answer the questions that I hope this work poses and raises, the more interesting ones. Um, and I'd just like to say that I hope I've demonstrated the worth of the approach I've taken. I've certainly had fun doing it, and I'd like you all to thank, uh, thank you all for listening. And finally, these are the people I owe thanks to. <laughs> <laughs> there we go.